Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our weekly mentoring hour. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We come week after week seeking you for your guidance, for your wisdom, for your knowledge, for a deeper revelation from your word, Lord. Father, we pray that you will lead this time of session, Lord. We pray that you will help us to meaningfully engage in the discussion and help us to grow in your word and in spirit. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today we have Pastor Nancy Ramya facilitate the discussion. And over to Pastor Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Diana. And uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, today for the mentoring hour. Uh, as usual, we are going to take time to, um, you know, answer some of the questions that uh, different ones of us have. These could be questions with regard to Christian life. They could be questions with regard to the course that, um, you know, people are doing at the Bible College. Or it could be, you know, something else that you've been wondering about and uh, are looking for um, answers to. So the questions can be uh, from any area. Uh, so I encourage uh, you to please go ahead and share those questions. You can either post it or you can unmute your mic and ask the question. We have uh, um, the APCBC faculty here who will answer those questions for us. So yes, please feel free. You could. Uh, Go ahead and ask your questions. Okay. So as we wait for our first question here, uh, I just noticed we have our students. Some of you have already shared about your ministry experience earlier. Uh, uh, Taisha, are you connected? Are you able to um, speak? Hi, Pastor. What did you say? Hi, please? hi. Yes. So uh, Taisha, I just uh, thought I would uh, uh, request you to share about the ministry that you are engaged in with your church. So if you're comfortable to share about what you're doing right now. Yes, I can share. Yes, okay. I am, I am a part of a church, but I have a ministry that is called Globe Trotters International Ministry. It is currently on, I go live on Facebook, YouTube, right, currently. I pretty much, it is about sharing the word of God, evangelical, you know, also I am, you know, I'm called to the office of the prophet, so I will prophesy as the Holy Spirit instructs, but um, let me backtrack how it started. I was at a prayer conference. Ernest is seeking God for direction. I was in New York at the time. I went I for a three-day conference, traveled from Jamaica for three days um, for this three-day conference. So at the conference, um, I saw, I heard a sound and it wasn't any sound. The, the musician was playing, yes, but I just heard a different sound. And when I looked at the drum set, there was a different person playing the drum. I was like, who was that? And that sound evokes something. There's something, stirs something in me. And when I look up, I saw an open vision over the, um, just in the air. And I saw where I am leading people to God and where they're clad in their armors. Different skin color, different race. We're just you know, having our, our shield on or sword, we are going up as if we're going up a ladder, we are going up. 
right? And so I didn't understood what it was. And then flew back to Jamaica, where I live currently, and um, still praying and seeking God and asking God for direction and um, what should I do? And then I heard Globe Trotters. I'm like, God, what is that? I don't know what is that. So I Googled and I saw Globe Trotters, different basketball team and different. And then I saw the definition of the word, you know, traveling from pretty much place to place and so forth. So I'm saying, okay. And then I heard Globe Trotters International Ministries. So I'm saying, okay i wasn't too comfortable with the name because it's not a name that you hear all about because i i'm like okay so god if you're gonna give me a name why could it be taisha ministries i i see a lot of people having that that's just the conversation i'm having with god right and so anyhow i continue to be obedient and you know continue to share live on facebook and um people tend to gravitate, share the word as he, and I will seek him and ask him, what should I share today? And I will share as he, the Holy Spirit leads and allow me to pray for people. Yeah. And people have begun to reach out to me and tell me how it has blessed them and so forth. But at times though, I will get overwhelmed and an attacks would come and I will say, God, what is this? And sometimes I do want to give up on their times because managing it and managing my job and everything, family life, it takes, it comes with maturity and, and you know, also wisdom. And so what I have learned to do is plan better, right? And seek God, you know, for a plan, a better planning. So that's what I'm doing this year to plan better. Yeah. Because I tend yes. to get burned out. And uh, as you know, I'm on a different time zone. It's now nighttime here and it's morning your time. Right. So sometimes I have to be, wow, oh my gosh, the classes, I fall asleep, I have to get up and try catch up yeah. and all that. So and I tend yeah. to find I, as I said, I get burned out and all of that, and I don't want to do it. And the Lord is saying, I saw a vision where he showed me the anointing oil splashed out on the floor that I'm wasting it. And I say, okay, God, help me. So I'm learning, as I say now, to the pitfalls, and I'm learning to grow in ministry and to seek, you know, and get help where I need help and encouragement and advice, you know because I can't do, it's not a one-man show, it's a team, you know. Sure, so sure. I am learning yeah. these things as, as, I, as I go on. So this is, yeah. so sure. at, presently I am live still and I'm sharing the gospel um, with people because as you know, we are called to do that. So that's where I'm at currently. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Taisha. Wonderful to hear about the ministry that you're engaged in and how it all got started and pray that God will bless you abundantly in the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Taisha. And uh, uh, right now we have a question in the chat for us. It is from John Paul. He asks, um, uh, hello, Pastor, in the incidents of King Saul calling prophet Samuel through witchcraft, after Prophet Samuel's death, was the spirit ap appeared a familiar spirit? This is in First Samuel 28. We see Samuel spoke. Is that Samuel himself um, or the evil spirit? That's the question from John Paul for us. Um, I uh, request one of our faculty, if you could please address this question. Um, Pastor Selena, would you be able to address John's question? I'm just looking. Uh, hi, Nancy. Thank you, John, for your uh, question. I'm just, just looking at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 28, and uh, we see that uh, 
you know, uh, King Saul uh, disguises himself and he goes uh, to the woman who calls, uh, you know, uh, brings out the spirits or calls spirits uh, from the land. And uh, uh, the uh, and King Saul asks the woman to uh, call out or bring out uh, Samuel. Uh, and uh, I think who the 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 spirit who comes out is Samuel, the old man wearing a robe is coming up. And she said, then uh, Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Okay, and Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Yeah, so we see uh, Samuel. So his question is that, uh, we see that Samuel spoke, is that Samuel himself or the evil spirit? But here it says that it is Samuel himself. Yeah. Spirit of Samuel that comes up. He says, Why are you disturbing me? I hope I, I just, uh, just want to interrupt here. Yeah, just, yes. I just want to interrupt here. Sorry. Yeah. So, so one thing uh, no human being has the power to call back a spirit uh, from heaven or hell, right? Uh, uh, other than the fact that we can raise the dead, right? Suppose a person is dead. Um, so we can't go and call back spirits. We don't have the right and the power to do it. So what we are seeing here in First Samuel 20 is an evil spirit because this woman is a witch. She is not dealing with God. She's dealing with evil spirits. So what we're seeing is an evil spirit impersonating Samuel. Right, so uh, that's what's happening here. Now, uh, Saul doesn't know that. King Saul doesn't know it. He's also under hiding. But this woman is a witch. She's dealing with the dark side. She's not dealing with God's side. So an evil spirit is impersonating Samuel and speaking out, right? Because no human being has the power to do it unless you know you're doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus to raise the dead. Um, that is, you bring a person back to life. You're not, you're not calling their spirit back. You're not talking to spirits. So um, in the Bible, we, we don't find that we have the authority to talk to departed spirits. It's not allowed. Uh, what we do see is impersonation. That is, evil spirits impersonate. And sometimes, you know, even, even when you're doing deliverance, you know, and I've had this happen uh, when, you know, your, uh, uh, for instance, there was an occasion right here in Bangalore, we were ministering deliverance to, this was not a Christian background, some of that. The evil spirit was speaking through that lady saying that I, this was what the spirit was saying, I am the spirit of that other person who committed suicide. That's what it is. No, immediately, because you know the word of God, you know that's not true. Okay. Because when the spirit dies, it's either going to go to the Lord in heaven or it's going, the human spirit, it's going to go to hell. So the evil spirit is lying. It's just saying that it's caught, trying to cause confusion in our minds, you know, so that we'll be going after the wrong target. And, and yes, yeah, so that cannot be. Right, because whoever committed suicide, that person, of course, may have been, you know, affected by demonic powers that prompted suicide. But the spirit of that person has gone wherever it should go, either hell or heaven. But in this person, it's an evil spirit. So you know, this is giving it a, a current day experience where the evil spirit is trying to tell lies it's trying to pretend to be the spirit of a departed person but it's not so to answer your first uh, this first samuel 28 is an evil spirit that's impersonating samuel just when you put it in biblical context i hope that's clear john thanks yeah but, but so just to uh, ask a follow-up question to that so in that case the evil spirit can also Tell what is going to happen because we see Samuel saying that you will be handed over to Philistines. So could that yeah. also happen? Yes, it can. You know, because in many cases they set it up. 
you know, or they will know things from our own lives, from our own conversations, you know, uh, and I've had that also happen to me, right? Like example, I was walking down the street and here are these people who are, uh, you know, they do these, I don't know what's the word we call, you know, these, they have all, they, they do this palm reading and all that. That man came to me and he told me some facts, like he, I'm a total stranger. And he, he told me some facts and he told me what I was going to do the next day. Right. But then I wasn't impressed because I know how evil spirits work. Right. Either they, they hear our conversation, so they know what we are planning to do. I was planning to travel to a certain place the next day. And this man, this total, you know, this man was practicing. Uh, what is, you know, they do the palm reading, all this stuff. He comes to me, he tells me. Now, I'm not impressed. Why? Because I know how evil spirits work. They listen to our conversations. So the evil spirit is empowering this man to tell tell me what I am planning to do the next day, which is true. Which is a, it's, a, it's a fact. But I'm not impressed. Or sometimes they actually set it up, which was the case in Saul's situation, where the evil spirit has idea, right? That, And they're going to set it up. Tomorrow is the day when things are going to happen. Saul's going to be killed. And, and Saul is out of the will of God. So Saul is actually in a place where he's completely vulnerable to the works of darkness, as you can see in the previous chapters. So that's how they, they are able to predict, foretell. Either they hear us in our conversations or they're setting things up against some person. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, John, for that question. Uh, we can go to our next question, which is uh, from Avni. Avni asks, um, good morning, pastors. I need more light on Jeremiah 2.13. What does broken cisterns mean? So I will just post this verse for us on the chat. Um, yeah. Broken cisterns that Jeremiah 2.13 refers to. Uh, would any of our faculty uh, like to explain this, please? Okay, uh, Pastor, could I please request you to um, elaborate on this for us? Yeah, yeah. so a uh, broken cistern is simply, uh, you know, pots that are broken. Basically, what God is saying is because his people have forsaken him, who is the source of living water, and gone after other gods, their vessels are broken. They're not, it's, you know, if you're having a broken vessels, it's leaking. You're, you're not having anything. So that's how they are uh, right now. So they just have broken vessels. That means whatever they think they are receiving from uh, other gods, it's like this. You're pouring water into a broken vessel. Is that okay? Yes. Ami, uh, is that all right? But did you get the answer yes, to the question? Pastor, oh, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Avni. Thank you, Pastor, for explaining that for us. Uh, we have another question in the chat um, regarding Job 4 and verse 18. I'm just uh, trying to get that verse for us. Yeah. This is from Elisha. He says, uh, please, Pastor, could you enlighten me on Job uh, 4 and verse 18? It says, if he puts no trust in his servants, if he charges his angels with error. Uh, Elisha uh, would like to request you to um, uh, elaborate on this. Uh, could you tell us exactly what answer you're looking for from this passage? Okay. Um, the, the portion that talks about uh, angels being charged with error. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, your question would be that can angels be charged with error? Is that the question? Exactly, exactly. Okay, all right. So Elisha is asking if angels can be charged with error. Uh, would uh, one of our faculty be able to take this up, please? Uh, thank you, uh, 
Elisha, for your question. I think here uh, it's uh, referring to one of the angels charged with error would be uh, Satan himself because uh, he was uh, one of the angels and, uh, uh, you know, uh, we see that he's a fallen angel and also we see that uh, he, uh, you know, there were quite a lot of other angels uh, who uh, it gave in to uh, Satan's claim of uh, being God himself and hence they were, uh, you know, thrown out of heaven uh, along with Satan. So yes, they can be, angels can be in error. And it can also be referring here to Satan who fell into error. Hope I answer that question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, um, would it be conclusive to suggest that and sin is not limited to human alone. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Elisha, for that uh, follow-up question. Um, I, I think I, I will uh, agree with Pastor Selina that angels can be charged with error. I am just reminded um, of Lucifer uh, that she mentioned about, we know that, you know, uh, everything that god creates is perfect so god created even the angels uh, in a perfect way however we know that uh, satan was filled with pride and then that led to deception in his heart and then you know that led to uh, his rebellion against god so uh, yes you know i i think they they can go into error in that way so uh, i hope that helps and if anyone else wants to add to that yeah, Pastor Nancy, I, I just wanted to uh, just, uh, I was just looking at the verse before that, and uh, I'm just going to read that out. It says, can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can a man be more pure than his maker if he puts no trust in his servants, if he charges his angels with error? Um, I, I think so. So when I'm reading this, I mean, these are poet, poetic books, so then it's like a, a rhetoric, rhetorical question in, in the sense of how um, uh, he's emphasizing, I think uh, this is this is the chapter where uh, uh, Eliphaz, uh, you know, he's, he's talking to Job. So he's making uh, the, the, the claim of how, um, you know, God is more powerful than man. God is more righteous than man. So as a part of, of that, uh, that, that uh, you know, that speech that he's saying, he's giving more emphasis on the fact of how God Himself is so powerful, and making that statement. So I mean, it's just just something that I I just thought I I don't know if uh, um, would would I mean I do agree with what uh, Pastor Selena said, but is it just to emphasize the righteousness of God or the mortality of God more than the mortality of man? So is that just His way of doing it, or is maybe a thought that I had? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jean, for that. And Elisha, I hope it uh, clarifies things for you. Yes, Pastor. Yes, yes, Pastor. Okay. Thank you Wonderful. very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Elisha. Uh, we will go to the next question here on our chat. This is from Abraham. Okay, uh, Elisha would request you to mute yourself, please. Okay, all right. So Abraham has uh, the next question for us where he asks, how do we handle leaders that are not really involved in the activities of the church? They behave like the things of God is a burden and not really in the vision. Uh, so it's a very practical question. How do we handle leaders that are not really involved in the activities of the church? Uh, any of our faculty, could you please uh, answer this question? For Abraham, okay, uh, Pastor Jaikumar, uh, like to request you to please share your thoughts. Yeah, uh, probably Pastor Ashish can actually answer this, but I'll just um, yeah, I'll just share this. So, um, so the thing is that uh, uh, we see a challenge here that the leaders are not uh, involved in the activities of the church, and they're not 
you know, uh, they're not really gelling with the vision of the church. Of course, the uh, the the natural thing to do uh, would be to to find out why uh, to find out why they are you know in such a place. Um, uh, so I'm assuming that they used to be you know very much uh, engaged with the activities of the church or engaged with the vision of the church and now there seems to be a kind of detachment so the, the who as leaders would be to find out why of course uh, there could be various reasons um, to find out why you know uh, maybe there's a I mean, they they are in a season where they have some you know just some issues challenges going on in their own lives and um, you know that's uh, uh, that's kind of taking precedence of every other thing maybe you know, just so uh, it could be one of the things or maybe there is uh, you know so there is sin in their own lives or you know whatever it is uh, so it could be various reasons why people are detached and it's it just becomes like a you know burden so um, just need to uh, find out and uh, and and then accordingly, um, you know, maybe reiterate the vision. Just find out, you know, what is happening. So um, so there could be various reasons why you know this could happen. So if we as leaders find out why, then we could be. I mean, we we would be able to address it, uh, you know, appropriately, um, and probably restore them and get them back um, to. I think. And uh, and also the other thing could be also. Uh, maybe they're in a, the uh, pastor can uh, address this, maybe, you know, like they are in a season where they should be doing something else. Uh, pastor, if you can, uh, you know, uh, address that. Yeah, like, um, yeah, Abraham, Abraham, like, um, you know, like what Pastor Zygmunt was saying, there could be several reasons. And it's good to find out uh, what is the reason. And uh, if you want to tell us more about what was actually happening, maybe we could, uh, you know, respond more directly to that. Abraham? Yes, yes, Pastor. Good morning, Pastors. Good morning. Um, we, it's just a, a one leader that uh, has been over a year now that he's been the same. So actually, I thought that he was growing, and I think that I thought that he was taking the things of God seriously. Uh, but recently, I discovered uh, he thinks that like um, he doesn't want the way the thing is going. Initially, we started with about uh, four people for almost about six months. So uh, we had a retreat, and during that retreat, we said, "Okay, since we are four and we have been very consistent, then let's consider ourselves as." those who are going to, let's say, lead this uh, activity. So let's say the four of us became leaders. But he hasn't been committed since he became a leader. I mean, sometimes he'll be in the leaders' meeting, sometimes he will not be there. But he, he always puts um, other things ahead of God's activity. In other words, he will tell you that if I have a meeting, it means that I will not come to church. If I have a meeting, it means that I will not come to leaders' meeting. So... Uh, he was selected based on the fact that he was part of us from the beginning. But it's been over a year now, and his commitment to ministry, if you call him to come and share, he will come and share. He will share wonderfully. But um, looking at his, his, his lifestyle in terms of uh, the way he does things, the way he, he, he's going to handle things, if you leave him alone, I don't think I should allow him to continue, or I don't know what to do, whether he was wrongly selected as a leader or maybe I'm not, because apart from him, the rest of the leaders are very active and they all, all of them know what we are doing and all of them are into the vision, except him. So I don't know how to handle him personally, whether to pray for him and all those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in this situation, it will be good that all four of you get together and have a discussion just to talk. Uh, where, you know, the expectations are made clear, you know, that, uh, okay, as if, if four of us are leading this work, uh, this is what we expect of each other. And this is what we are all, ha we have committed ourselves to do. And then uh, you could then bring up the, you know, the whole matter that, uh, see, we are only seeing three people being, you know, doing all the, the leadership work. 
uh, but the fourth person has over the past one year has not been involved other than coming to minister uh, whenever he's been asked to. So you could find out what is the matter. You know, so you do it as a group because you have started as a group, three or four of you. Sit down, have a conversation. Uh, and, and, and you're not doing it in a judgmental way. You're doing it in a very, you know, you want to find out what is the reason. And then, you know, uh, like Pastor Kumar was saying, you'll find out the real reason. Maybe he is not really interested or maybe he's, um, you know, he's got distracted with other things, whatever, you know. And then, so in that case, you can say, see, uh, you can explain in that meeting, you know, after he has had his chance to say, you know, why he's not been able to be committed for the last one year, then you, then that's a good opportunity to explain, saying, look, mm, to be part of this leadership team, this is the expectation, right? We have to be committed. We have to make time to be there at the church services. We have to make time to do, you know, provide leadership for this group of people. And uh, uh, because, you know, you, you have shared with us that you don't, you're unable to do it, is it okay that we ask you to, uh, you know, step down from leadership? And there's nothing wrong in asking somebody to step down because if, you know, if somebody's not able to fulfill that role, there's no point in having them hold on to that role just for name's sake, you know. Uh, that they're, they're adding no value to anybody and they could just become a burden to carry with you. So you could have that. And But you're doing everything in the spirit of love. You're doing it everything with being fair and just. And then you ask him, so, you know, is it okay if you step down? Because, you know, as a leader, this is what you're supposed to be doing. And then, uh, you know, you will, you should just be prepared for different reactions because we are all human. Uh, there are some people who would understand that, yeah, look, they have not been able to keep up with what they have requested, so they will step down. So that is a very positive response. But sometimes there will be negative responses as well. They will say, you know, they may go back and, you know, do things against the three of you, whatever, you know, that this is all just human reaction. But as long as you're doing it in the spirit of love and you're doing it in a very fair way, your hands are clear, your hands are clean, your heart is clean, just keep moving forward. Okay, Pastor, please, uh, another quick question. Um, during our retreat, we received a confirmation that this is what the Spirit of God wants us to do. But that one came from one of the sisters who, who barely knew the vision. But personally, you know, I'm expecting an encounter from the Lord, something that the Lord will just tell me that this is what I want you to do. You know, we have not had any struggle in what we are doing. And seriously, we have been led by the Spirit of God for over a year now. Things have been very smooth. I mean, you find the people coming in, you find things happening outside my own control and outside my personal bedding. So the question is, do I need to hear from God aside the prophecies I've received from uh, some of these leaders, or, and then outside um, those that at least I have known for some time, they have confirmed what we are doing. But personally, there is no word from the Lord to say that this is what I want you to do. But I see light coming, I see direction coming. So what do I do? Do I still seek God for a direct voice to say that this is what I want you to do in Vietnam? Or we just stop? I just want to be very sure. Or there's no need. Mm. So uh, we know that um, every prophetic word has to be tested, right? Uh, First Thessalonians chapter 5, 21, 22. You know, so it says, don't despise prophecies, but test all things. So we're not, you know, we're welcoming prophecy, but we're tested. And especially when it has to do with direction, right? So let's say, you know, this person who is new, maybe new to the group, has come in and has shared this prophetic word saying, you have to do this, this. Well, receive it. Then, but then don't immediately go to it. You pray about it, right? Um, since you have a leadership team, you know, the three of you can discuss about it. And then wait for God's, you know, guidance. So Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. In the mouth, of two or three witnesses, every word is established. 
So you look for two more witnesses, right? Two more ways that God, you know, so the one is this person has spoken, but what, what do the leaders feel? Is it right? You know, is, do you have peace about it? Uh, are, are the doors opening for that particular direction? Uh, uh, in these kind of things. So you wait uh, for two or three witnesses, you know, around that. Sometimes this may be a word that has been given in advance. You know, maybe it was something God spoke now, but it's going to happen five years from now. It's okay. So just wait for the time to come. You know, maybe it's a true word, but the timing is in the future. So you wait for that. Um, yeah, so, but the thing is, there's nothing wrong uh, in testing it and nothing wrong in looking for two or three witnesses as a confirmation before you actually step out on it. Now, if it is a, a not so significant word, meaning it's just like, okay, go buy chocolates. Okay, you can try it out, you know, <laughs> just go buy some chocolates. Uh, but if it's something, you know, very serious, then you have to, you know, be more cautious. Uh, yeah. All right, thank you so much, Pastor. Thank you so much. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Jay Kumar and uh, uh, Abraham for your questions. Uh, we have a question from Zeli Toli. Uh, she asks, recently she watched video, YouTube video, um, why your church shouldn't play Bethel and Hillsong music from, the, uh, from a certain channel. And it really concerned me because the speakers were discussing most of the lyrics not in line with the word of God and also their core the belief, not biblically, because they believe in sucking anointing from the graves of anointed men and women of God who died uh, and uh, so on, etc. So it really concerned me. So what's the take um, of APC? So that is her question. Um, I would like to uh, just share a few yes, thoughts, and maybe Pastor Jakes can uh, add to it too. Yes, uh, so Zeli, thank you for that question. Uh, I just want to start off by saying that at ABC, uh, we do sing uh, Hillsong and Bethel. Uh, reason being, uh, many of the songs are very much in line with the Word of God, very much written out of uh, from a place of you know conviction, a place of experience that how they experienced God. Uh, so yes, in APC, we do sing Bethel and Hillsong music even now. But uh, from what you are saying, uh, yes, we we have seen that, uh, you know, this whole thing of uh, sucking anointing from the graves. Now, these are certain practices that they follow. Uh, and so as, as, as a church, we don't subscribe to those uh, practices. Uh, but what we do is we, we do understand that, okay, these songs, uh, worship is more unto God. So when we do sing well, Bethel and worship song, uh, and hill songs, uh, we are worshiping the Lord. And it's not about who's written the song. Uh, of course, it, 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 you know, they, the Lord has used them to uh, bless the body of Christ. But the worship is more to God than, you know, uh, in our mind when we are, you know, worshiping the Lord. It's not about, okay, it's a Bethel song or it's a Hill song, song so it has to be good. Uh, but it's more about, God, we are singing this to worship you, uh, to glorify your name. And so uh, we don't subscribe to their beliefs, certain beliefs, or their, not beliefs, but their practices, uh, like uh, uh, grave soaking and all of those things. Uh, but a lot of their songs are uh, very... Uh, uh, very much in line with the word of God and uh, very powerful, uh, which has blessed me personally as well. So uh, so I would leave it at that. And maybe Pastor Jakes could uh, interject and add his thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks. Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, thanks, Zeli, for the question. So, um, so the thing is this, that, um, you know, as a church, uh, as believers, we need to be discerning about any song that we sing. You know, uh, I just want to do, you know, just any song. So to see that is, is it, you know, in line with the word of God, you know, be it a hymn, be it, uh, you know, so, so in the past, you know, we've had to kind of change a few lines here and there. Uh, 
because it didn't sit well. It was um, the context of it was not really in line with, um, you know, with the word of God. It, it was from, you know, popular songwriters uh, of the day. And there's nothing wrong about them. Good believers, sincere believers, very passionate for the Lord, love the Lord. But here and there, you know, we ha we've had to make changes because it's uh, so that it, it will sit well uh, and be aligned with the word of God. So, so, um, so that's one thing that I would, you know, say that we need to be you know, discerning. Uh, it can come from any, you know, any of the like big worship movements, be it Vineyard or, you know, Hillsong or, you know, any of these uh, uh, churches that God has used to birth these songs. So it could come from any source, um, but we need to, it's our personal responsibility, you know, as, as believers and maybe as a, as a worship ministry to make sure, uh, be discerning that it's, it's in line with the word of God, right? Um, particularly about um, this particular channel, you no? Know, like what I noticed was, um, well, uh, you know, they brought out a lot of information, but um, rather than eliminate the truth, I, I noticed that it was more from a place of a cr critical spirit. Uh, the whole ministry of this particular thing was uh, in the, you know, in, in wanting to bring the, uh, truth and clarify truth to the body of Christ. It is more of a critical spirit. That's something that I personally noticed. Um, so, uh, so I would take that with a pinch of salt. But you know, having gone through that video myself, um, just want to clarify that um, you know one thing about this uh, you know uh, grave sucking. Okay, so um, you know uh, this was uh, apparently from what I uh, what I saw and what I also uh, he heard some of the interviews, watched some of the interviews. It was some somebody started it. One of the students of the um, uh, of the school, you know, of the supernatural school, with the some of the one of the students, uh, like all the students, very excited, very uh, you know, uh, uh, radical, and and they read about this uh, how uh, the, the 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 person was thrown into Elisha's grave and uh, Elisha, Elisha, I forget, and then he came alive, right? So. And so they just took it to that extreme and saying, hey, there is this anointing in this man of God and this woman of God. And so therefore I'm just going to soak it up. And that's how they, you know, they started it and then uh, it became a uh, uh, thing. But with regard to their core beliefs, um, you know, it's a statement of faith and core beliefs, uh, I, I personally don't see anything wrong. It seems to be um, in, in place. So yeah, so that is, uh, that's something that I just wanted to share. Uh, thank you. Hope that helps a little bit. Um, just to add, um, uh, in uh, if you go to Google Podcasts, um, Bill Johnson has one of his podcast channels, and just recently, that's twenty fifth December, he did a short sermon where he kind of clarified this whole thing. Uh, he the sermon itself is the title of the sermon is "Death Bethel Church Teach Grave Soaking." So if you're interested, Zalatoli, you could go and listen to it. It's just, it's just a short 25-minute uh, talk. But, you know, basically clarifies their stand. They don't. Basically, they, they don't, right? But as, you know, uh, people outside can get wrong ideas and, and, and sometimes just from little actions that happen. But as a church itself, he clarifies. In fact, he did a series of messages during December uh, clarifying various, you know, what we call as wrong ideas about Bethel Church. One of them was this grave soaking, and then there's another one on this Kundalini spirit. And there are a lot of, uh, see, there are, there are a lot of uh, wrong ideas that people have, out, so let's say, against Bethel Church or against, you know, other ministries. It's always good to hear from the person inside, you know, because people outside could misinterpret or misrepresent. And uh, and it's very clear that uh, so if you're interested, you could go in and it's just something, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, pastors, for uh, all these insights. Uh, and I hope uh, Zelitoli, uh, you've received your answer and you know, certain things have been clarified for you. Yeah. Okay. I see her answer here on the chat. She says, "Okay, thank you, pastors. It's helpful." So uh, that's wonderful. Uh, we have one more question here. I think we can accommodate this. Uh, this is uh, from Elisha. He asks, is there any specific time in the night that makes prayers effective? Some people suggest praying between the hours of 12 midnight to 3 a.m. is more effective on the devil. 
Uh, so uh, any of our faculty, could you throw light on this question, please? Uh, Pastor Nancy, I'll, I'll yeah. just uh, Please go ahead. Add in. Yeah, so I think that the Bible talks about uh, what, uh, where, where is prayer effective? And I just want to make it short and just give you two places where it talks about. It says in James 5.16 that the um, prayer of the righteous, the, a righteous person is what is powerful and effective. So it is the fervent, effectual prayer that makes prayer effective. And the other places, uh, it talks about how you can go to Jesus, to, to God in confidence, to ask him for anything, and he will hear us. So it's a confident prayer um, uh, in the name of the Lord that makes it effective. And I don't think scripture talks about a specific time that prayers are effective. So I just wanted to bring scripture to that. Anyone else can add? Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Uh, any of our other faculty? Would you also like to share your thoughts on this, please? Okay. Uh, Elisha, I'll just add uh, one scripture yeah jean has already shared some uh, scripture portions uh, the the you know the scripture references there in our chat uh, i'll add another one to it hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 it says uh, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need so uh, that also you know kind of says anytime anytime you want uh, god to respond uh, anytime you want to pray, uh, it's all right, you know. As uh, Jean pointed out uh, in the Bible, we don't see any specific uh, time or, or part of the day given uh, for us to pray and uh, you know, petition the Lord. Uh, and I hope that clarifies things for you. I'll just uh, read out uh, the references that uh, Jean has given, James 5.16, 1 John 5, verses 14 through 15. Uh, so, uh, Elisha, does that help? Yes, yes, Pastor. Yes, Pastor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have just uh, about um, three minutes left. If anyone has a quick question, we could accommodate that. But, Not really Pastor Nancy, sorry. sorry, please. Pastor Nancy, sorry. Mm -hmm. Please, could you repeat your, your reference for me? Yes, yes, Elisha. It is uh, Hebrews 4 and verse 16. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I think uh, we will uh, pray and close for today. Uh, just like to request someone to lead us in a word of prayer, then we can wrap up today's entering our session. Uh, Elisha, would you like to pray, please? Okay. We are praying. Our, our Heavenly Father, once again, we are grateful and thankful unto you for this great mercy and grace that you have bestowed on us. We thank you for your guidance in this meeting. We thank you for your spirit-inspired responses that we have had from our faculty. We pray that, Lord, may this response that we have received impact our souls, our daily lives, and our ministries in the name of Jesus. Father, we continue to ask that you supply us with the, in, with the great grace to, pay, to continue our task in this day. In Jesus' mighty name we pray that we thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Thank you, Elisha. Thank you, uh, faculty. Thank you, students, for joining in today. God bless you. Uh, and uh, Have a wonderful day. We will meet again. Uh, next Thursday for uh, our mentoring hour and tomorrow would be our supernatural hour at 8 a.m. So see you then. God bless you.